Hear now the sermon text reading from Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth had been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus, who is our rock, our redeemer, our elder brother. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Each and every week at the end of our covenant renewal worship service, after we have been called into God's presence, after we have confessed our sins, after we have been consecrated by God through his word, after we have communed with him at his table, the very final act that God performs, the very final word of God that we receive is that he tells us to depart with his blessing to go and serve him in the midst of our world. That is the last thing that each week, the last thing that we hear from our heavenly king is that he gives us his commission, his command, his charge, and his calling. And the commission is each week for us to go out into his world, bearing his name upon our hearts, living as his people, being his body in the midst of our world, so that as we live each week, we might bring him glory, we might bring his light, his hope, his peace into our restless and hopeless world. Each week we leave here having received what we might call a mini commission from our Lord. And the reason I want to call it a mini commission is because Christ has already left his church the great commission. In the last minute that our resurrected Lord spent with his disciples, he commissioned them and he charged them by saying, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And this is the great commission, the great charge, the great call that Christ has left his church. And each week we leave with a reminder, each week we live with an application to live out that great commission in our upcoming week in very particular ways. And so what's interesting is that our worship ends the same way that Christ's physical and bodily presence with his disciples end, with a charge for them to go out into the world with the gospel, to turn the world upside down in Jesus' name. But this commissioning that Jesus gave to his disciples, while in one, in one sense it ends Jesus' uh, physical, Jesus' bodily presence with his church in another way it launches the church out on her mission in the power of the spirit so our commission at the end of each week ends our time meeting together with christ in his heavenly presence but it then launches us out in his name into the world in his, in our week and so as we wind down our series on the post-resurrection appearances of christ we are considering today his great commissions that he leaves his church with. Because we are pretty familiar with the great commission in the book of Matthew that we have heard read, but we should be aware that each of the four gospels contains a great commission passage. And this morning I want to consider, however briefly, each one. And we begin this morning by looking at the great commission of Matthew Mark and Luke together. And when we join them together, what we basically get three themes, and those are the themes of authority, the theme of mission, and the theme of power. So let's begin with authority. Because the most famous great commission passage comes at the very end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. 
And the very first thing that strikes us is the absolute authority that Jesus Christ declares, that Jesus Christ claimed for himself. He says, all authority, every last bit of any ultimate authority belongs to Christ. He says authority in heaven. Well, in the Bible, heaven is the place that rules earth. Heaven is the place from which God controls all things. One pastor said that heaven is the control room over earth. And so if Jesus has all authority in heaven, that should be enough. If all authority in heaven is Christ, then it also means that he rules over earth. But as if to leave no doubt for anyone that is hearing him, he tells us not only does he possess all authority in heaven, but he also possesses all authority on earth. He is king over all. He is ruler over all. He is master over all. There's no higher power. There is nothing or anyone more central, more fundamental, more important, more authoritative than Jesus Christ. And this fact, this fact of the absolute authority of Christ is, uh, for the, is fundamental, is ground level for the life and the mission of the church. What is it that gives the church her life, her splendor, and her calling? Well, it is the fact that the church is the bride of the highest king. That the church is the body of the all-authoritative Lord. That the church is the temple in which the God-man dwells. And so the very fundamental fact, the foundation of the church that she is built upon and grounded upon is this authority of Christ. That he has the authority to forgive any and all sins. That he has the authority to sovereignly call sinners to himself. That he has the authority over our spiritual death by which we are dead in sin. That he has authority over physical death, and he promises that we will rise again. That he has authority over all of our enemies, whether human or demonic. That he has authority over all aspects of our lives. The fact that Christ has all authority, and the fact that we are united to him, is the bedrock foundation for the life and the mission of the church. Because of this absolute authority, Jesus said, therefore, because I have all authority, therefore, go. Because I have all authority, it has all been given to me, therefore, you, church, you, bride of Christ, you, disciples of Jesus Christ, have a calling and a mission to fulfill. And the mission could not be any greater. Go into all the ethnos, go into all the nations, and disciple them. Now some people want to interpret this to say that we are go into all the nation and make disciples of the small amount of individual people that are found throughout all of these nations. We are to find little pockets of men and women to disciple among all the nations of the earth, but that is not what Jesus says. He tells his 11 disciples to go and disciple the nation by baptizing the nation and teaching the nations to obey all that Christ has commanded. The picture that Christ leaves his disciples here is not a small remnant of people gathered in holy huddles in various nations, but a transformation of all the nations of the earth. But this is not anything new if we have been reading our Bibles up to this point. This is in line with all of the Old Testament visions and promises and pictures that are given to us from Abraham to, Ze to Zechariah. Just a few pictures. Think about Psalm 22. That psalm that Jesus Christ cries out upon the cross that begins with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That psalm that goes on to give us some of the most detailed prophecies about Jesus on the cross. Evil men surround me. My hands and my feet are pierced. Men can see my bones. Men cast lots to see which one of them are going to take my clothing home with them. But what is all the result 
of all the suffering, all the, the, the pain that we see in the first half of Psalm 22, halfway through the psalm, the tune changes. Praise breaks out in the second half of the psalm. He says, I will praise your name in the great congregation. And what are we to praise his name about? David goes on and he says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Consider Psalm 72, a, a psalm composed to the, the great and coming king, the royal son. And he says, may all kings fall down before you, and may the nation serve him. May the people be blessed in him, and all nations call him blessed. The carrying out of this mission by the disciples to all nations is rooted in the very Abrahamic covenant. God promises that in you, all the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It is a, a application of what God promises in the uh, promise made to David that we read today, that you, your descendant throne will be established forever. This gospel going out and transforming the nations is predicted by the prophets, who state that all the nations shall come to Christ, that all the kings will come to the brightness of his rising, Isaiah 60. That all the nations will stream to Zion, that all the nations will worship the Lord, that all the nations will sit at his feet. The gospel transforming every nation of the earth is the Bible's vision from beginning to end. And some might ask, how can this happen? I cannot believe that this great vision, that God is actually going to transform this world. Well, again, we can answer that pretty simply, that Jesus has just declared that he has all authority, that he has all power, that it has all been given for him, and he can do what he wants. And so when people come to doubt this vision, when people come to question this vision, when people try to think of a way to get around this gospel, world-transforming vision, it is always tempting to reply with Jesus' words that you know neither the scripture nor the power of God. And the great commission that we see in Mark is a very similar call. But Mark actually expands it. Not only is the gospel to go out into all nations, but he said, you shall go out and preach the gospel to all of creation. All of the creation that was broken by sin will be renewed in Jesus Christ. This earth that is now broken by creation will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord just as the waters cover the sea, as Habakkuk 2 tells us. And so this great commission is the church's mission rooted in the authority of Christ but how is it that we, we people who are weak, we people who are fallible sinners ourselves, how are we expected to uh, fulfill this great call in Christ? Well, this is where we come to Luke's great commission. In Luke, what we see is the very same focus on mission. Luke 24, beginning in verse 47, says, Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. But what Luke gives us then is in addition. For Jesus states, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What Jesus here is referring to is his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit both is the promise of the Father and is the power of God from on high. And this is what Luke's second book, the book of Acts, shows us. That Christ gives his spirit to his followers and it, this spirit that empowers the disciples to go out from Jerusalem, to go out from about a hundred disciples, just a few more people that are in this room to, today and begin to transform the world, turning it upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So the church can pursue this great commission because she has been grounded and founded upon the authority of Christ, because she has been sent out from Christ, and because she has been empowered with his Holy Spirit that he puts within her. This spirit is the spirit that has the power that first brought creation to being out of nothing. This spirit is the spirit that has the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And this same spirit with that power of creation and new creation and now resides in the church, now resides in individual believers to bring a new creation in a people and in a world that is dead in sin. And so again, people may ask, can we really expect to see nations discipled and baptized into Christ? Well, I think we can ask if all of this is true, if Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, if the power, if the spirit, the spirit with the power of creation and new creation is put within her church to empower her on her mission, then how can this not be true? How can this not be our expectation? This is the Great Commission. I hope at this point you are all excited, you are all hopeful, you are all have your expectations raised by the big picture that Jesus Christ leaves with his disciples. But you might also be asking, what does this practically look like for me? How can I participate in the Great Commission? And so we turn to the book of John. What we see and what we have seen in John is that actually earlier in the chapter 20, Jesus gives a brief commissioning, which we saw a few weeks ago where Jesus tells his disciples, just as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. But then we turn to chapter 21. Now chapter 21 really reads like a kind of postscript to the book. John could have ended in chapter 20. The end of chapter 20 seems like he was winding down the book, but then tacks on chapter 21 to give us one last scene of Jesus and his disciples. Now, in the time after the resurrection, Jesus had already appeared to his disciples a couple times. He had already appeared to his disciples in the book of John twice before, but he was really not with them consistently. It seems like the disciples didn't know when Jesus was going to come and when Jesus was going to go. And so they were sitting around, and what does Peter say? Peter says, let's go fishing. And all the disciples said, amen, let's go fishing. And you know the rest of the story, that they went fishing all night, and they caught nothing. And at dawn, Jesus appeared by the side of the lake, and he tells them to cast their nets into the right side of the boat. And they pull out a cat that was so great that they could not haul it in. Now what's interesting is that this miracle is something that we see again earlier in other gospel accounts. In Luke 5, when Jesus appears to call the disciples to himself, he does a very similar thing. And when Peter cast in the net in Luke chapter 5, and he, he, he had so many fish that he can't pull it in, when he gets to shore, he sees Jesus, and he falls at his feet, and he says, Lord, depart from me, because I am a sinner. Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinner. But Jesus' response is, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And now it's three years later, and when Peter realizes that Jesus, no longer is he sending Jesus away, but Peter is putting on his garment, jumping in the lake, and swimming after his Lord. And Peter knows that he is still a sinner. But instead of wanting Jesus to depart because of his sin, he now wants to be present with Jesus because of his sin. He now knows that there's no other answer for his sin apart from being with Jesus. And there are some interesting details in this story. And the Holy Spirit does not like to waste his breath. The first interesting little detail is we are told that Jesus was making a charcoal fire. This is a very interesting detail. For the last time that we see a charcoal fire in the book 
of John was in the night in which Jesus was betrayed. While Jesus was being put on trial in front of the high priest, while they were striking him and beating him, while he is giving his testimony, Peter was outside in the courtyard comforting himself and warming himself in front of a charcoal fire. And it was in front of this charcoal fire that Peter would deny his Lord three times. And here we have this charcoal fire built by Jesus. A place where Peter can come back to Jesus. A place where Peter can reaffirm his love for Jesus. A place where Peter can find forgiveness for his failure of Jesus. Where in the first charcoal fire was a place of division. In this second charcoal fire, Peter can find reconciliation and forgiveness and restoration. And then we get the details that there were 153 fish. Now why would John give us such an exact number? Now it's interesting to read, and, and a lot of the church fathers particularly gave various answers, but what's interesting is they all had the basic same conclusion, that this number 153 really represented the nation that Peter, as a fisher of men, was called to go out and capture by the gospel. St. Augustine said that it is a triangular of 17. Now you might be thinking, I didn't come from math class, what does that mean? Well, if you take all the numbers leading up to 17, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way to 17, you get 153. 17 is often a number related to the Gentile nation. When Joseph went into Egypt, he was 17 years old. When Jacob goes to Egypt, he lived there for 17 years before he died. On the day of Pentecost, when they were preaching to all the nations that had gathered in on Jerusalem, Luke lists off 17 nations that were there. Augustine contemporary St. Jerome said that at, that at that time, they believed that there were only 153 species of fish in the world. And so the disciples that day caught every single kind of fish and brought them to Jesus Christ on the shore, just as it was their calling to go out into all the world and gather all the men from all the nations and bring them to Jesus Christ. And so what's interesting, no matter how they do the math with 153, people throughout the church had pointed to the fact that this represents the disciples, Peter particularly, bringing the nations to Jesus Christ. And after this great catch of fish, after they eat and they commune together, Jesus reconciles himself to Peter. Just as Peter had betrayed Jesus three times, so Jesus allows Peter three times to reaffirm his love. Once again, Peter is no longer hiding his sin and shame, telling Jesus to simply go away and let him be, but Peter is coming to Jesus for forgiveness and reconciliation. And each time Peter reaffirms his love of Jesus, he receives a commission from Christ. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Then feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Then tend to my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know, Lord, that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter is reconciled to Christ, and in the midst of that reconciliation, he is sent out in service of Jesus. He is sent out to tend and to feed the lamb and the sheep of Christ. Now, this is a very specific call for Peter that he lived out. In the book of Acts, we see that Peter is the very first one to go to the true Gentile Cornelius with the gospel. But what does it mean for us? Well, I think it means pretty much the same thing by way of application. It shows us that when we come to Jesus Christ to be reconciled, when we come to him to be forgiven, he then sends us out on his mission. For what we see in scripture is when God calls people to himself, that is never the end of the story, but that is always the beginning of the story. 
I think sometimes we have this idea in our head that when we come to Jesus Christ, when we submit ourselves to him, when we finally put our faith in him, it is at that end that the drama of our story is over. We're in Christ and we basically just have to live out the rest of our days until we go to be with him. But in the Bible, the call to God is what begins the story. Right, Abraham was already a fairly old man when God called him to himself, but it was at his calling in Genesis 12 that his story really began. Right, it was at the time when David had already spent years out in the field tending the sheep, but in the scriptures his story begins when he is called by God and anointed. So it is with us. When we come to Jesus, it is not the end of our story, but it's the beginning of our story. It is not the end of our mission, but it's the beginning of our mission because finally now at that point, we are in God's mission. And what is it that he commissioned you to do? Same thing he commissioned Peter. Feed his lambs, tend his sheep, feed his sheep. This very particular call to Peter is a very general call to each and every one of us. What does Christ want us to do? He wants us to offer him to others. He wants us to offer his food, to offer Christ and his gospel to all of his sheep. And so if you are a parent here, look down at your covenant children. These are Christ's lambs. Christ is calling you to feed them upon Christ, to point them to Christ in his word, to lead them to the gospel, to shape their heart in Jesus Christ, to bring them to feed on Christ in his word, to bring them to Christ's fount, to bring them to his table, so that they might grow knowing and believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. If you are a member of this church, it is part of your task to feed Jesus Christ to one another. It is part of your calling, it is something that you have vowed to do to tend to one another and look after one another. It is our calling to talk about Jesus Christ to one another, to admonish and to encourage one another in Jesus Christ, to point each other to Jesus Christ and his gospel. And each and every one of us, when we go out into the world, we should do so ready with the food of the gospel, so that all whom Christ will call can come and feed on him and believe. And so all of the great commission that we find in the gospel together present this great and wonderful picture of the gospel transforming the nations of this world. And Christ commissioned us to fulfill this picture to fulfill this calling. But the way we do so is simply with ordinary faithfulness of ordinary believers, that we go out from here, that we point each other to Jesus Christ, that we talk about Jesus Christ, that we shape each other in the gospel, and that we call one another to believe on his name. And it is this way, this ordinary faithfulness by believers that Christ will use to transform all the nations of the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this great promise that the gospel will go out into all nations. Father, we ask that you would give us the faith to believe his promise this morning. And that we would be obedient in our ordinary calling to go out and feed the lambs and the sheep of Christ with the gospel. Father, we do thank you and we ask that he would, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen.